In today's episode, we open our Bibles to Hosea, chapters 2 and 3. Israel's idolatry is described in terms of marital infidelity, something that, because of Yahweh's command, Hosea is now intimately familiar with because of his marriage to the unfaithful Gomer. Hosea depicts Yahweh as the betrayed husband and Israel as his unfaithful wife. Good morning and blessed Lenten tide. Today is Tuesday, March 7th, and you're listening to Thy Strong Word. Each weekday morning, we explore the holy scriptures through which God bespeaks us righteous and nourishes our faith. I'm your host, Pastor Phil Boo of St. John Lutheran Church in Laverne, Minnesota. Thy Strong Word is sponsored in part by the Lutheran Heritage Foundation, a recognized service organization in the LCMS that assists congregations and missionaries in sharing the good news of Jesus through Lutheran materials translated into foreign languages. Visit lhfmissions.org to learn more. Well, as we move into the second and third chapters of Hosea, I'm pleased to have as my guest this morning, the Reverend Kevin Parviz, pastor of Congregation Kaiva Shalom in St. Louis, Missouri. Good morning, Pastor Parviz, and welcome back to Thy Strong Word. Good morning. How are you doing? Oh, I am doing great. The last time that you were on the program, we were covering Esther, and we talked a little bit about the Feast of Purim or Purim during that time. And here we are on March 7th, going into the second day of Purim. Isn't that right? Yes, we uh, had our Purim party already, and it was a great time. And uh, we're in Purim now on the calendar. Excellent. Wow. I was just wondering if your congregation was celebrating. I figured you were. So that's wonderful. Yeah, it's just, just kind of a neat coincidence that we've welcomed you back here during Purim. Yeah, we always have our Purim party on the Friday night before, so it was a fun time. And kids got the groggers out and dressed up and basically were crazy, and it was it was great. <laughs> nice. It's a, good, it's, a, it's a really good Lenten feast because there's so much sackcloth and ashes, but yet God... And we always recognize, even during Lent, that God continues, just like in Hosea, continues to hope for repentance and call for repentance and move for repentance. And, of course, in uh, in Esther, that repentance is rewarded, that uh, Mordechai does as well here, hopefully. But I think we don't see that in Israel, so... Mm. Well, we'll have to dig in and find out. Before we do that, though, would you uh, would you start our time together off in prayer? Sure. Abba Father, thank you for this day, and thank you for this season. As we uh, become introspective about ourselves, Father, we pray by your Holy Spirit that you would continue to speak repentance into our hearts, Lord, that we would hear and repent and be received and forgiven. Father, we thank you for the great mercy that you show us and the mercy that you showed us through your son's death on the cross. And, uh, and Lord, we thank you also for the great resurrection that gives us hope. B'Shem Yeshua HaMashiach, in the name of Jesus, our Messiah. Amen. Amen. So, brother, well, as we, uh, as we get ready to get into the text then, I think it might be good if you would just catch us up a little bit. We've only, we're only one chapter in, so we're not that far in, but it would be a good idea for those who may have missed the program yesterday to, uh, well, hear, hear where we've come so far before we see where we're going. Well, you did all the hard work yesterday, this, um, this bizarre call of Hosea to marry a, a prostitute and bear children and name those children as a sign to Israel of what was to become of them. And so Hosea, in his faithfulness, has done that. Um, he's, I think, had three children, uh, Jezreel and Not My People and No Mercy, great names to live by. <laughs> right. Uh, yeah, and these these become uh, the 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 symbol, if you will, uh, to Israel of God's judgment upon them as well. Who I mean, Hosea's entire life is an object lesson to Israel, right? Yeah, and so they they see it within the life of their prophet, but of course he also gets to really experience firsthand how how. God experiences our unfaithfulness, and yet he still continues to love us, as Hosea will demonstrate his love for Gomer. Uh, But now in in chapter 2, 
we're getting to the point where Yahweh is telling him, now it's your time, it's your, it's your, it's your moment to go and start uh, declaring the, the, right. the indictment of God, basically. Um, and so yeah, the, that's where we're going to begin. Do you have a, do you want to take it section by section? How would you like for us to study it this morning? I mean, it's a, it's, you're, you're, the, you're the leader here. I, I follow your lead, <laughs> but I do think there is, uh, I mean, really from the first 13 verses is really the first section. Yeah. Um, and so, well, you know, say to your brothers, you are my people. That's what Hosea begins with. Okay. Well, why don't we read just then those first 13 verses, and we'll uh, then we'll just slowly make our way through it. So here we go. Okay. Starting with chapter 2, verse 1, and this is going to be from the English Standard Version. Say to your brothers, you are my people, and to your sisters you have received mercy. Plead with your mother, plead, for she is not my wife and I am not her husband, that she put away her whoring from her face and her adultery from between her breasts lest I strip her naked and make her as in the day she was born and make her like a wilderness and make her like a parched land and kill her with thirst. Upon her children also I will have no mercy because they are children of whoredom. For their mother has played the whore. She who conceived them has acted shamefully. For she said, I will go after my lovers who give me my bread and my water, my wool and my flax, my oil and my drink. Therefore, I will hedge her up way, pardon me, hedge up her way with thorns, and I will build a wall against her so that she cannot find her paths. She shall pursue her lovers, but not overtake them, and she shall seek them, but shall not find them. Then she shall say, I will go and return to my first husband, for it was better for me then than now. And she did not know that it was I who gave her the grain, the wine, and the oil and who lavished on her silver and gold, which they used for Baal. Therefore I will take back my grain in its time, and my wine in its season, and I will take away my wool and my flax, which were to cover her nakedness. Now I will uncover her lewdness in the sight of her lovers, and no one shall rescue her out of my hand. And I will put an end to all her mirth, her feasts, her new moons, her sabbaths, and her appointed feasts. And I will lay waste her vines and her fig trees, of which she said, These are my wages, which my lovers have given me. I will make them a forest, and the beasts of the field shall devour them. And I will punish her for the feast days of the Baals, when she burned offerings to them, and adorned herself with her ring and jewelry, and went after her lovers, and forgot me, declares Yahweh. Wow. So, <laughs> the unfaithfulness of Israel is going to be punished, God says, and in a very colorful way, we get that message. Yeah, absolutely. The uh, yeah, and I, and I, in a, in a way, this always reminds me of Jeremiah thirty-one, where God tells us that He was our husband, but He and He was faithful to us, even though we were not faithful to Him. Uh, and then, and then he, then Jeremiah prophesies the new covenant in which uh, Jesus institutes the Lord's Supper. Um, yeah, I mean, we we do in, in times of idolatry, we do tend to believe that the things that we have are by our own hand or given to us by another who we worship above God, maybe an employer, whoever what, but. Uh, Israel has really turned away from God and has uh, turned to idols, and and God is not going to take that from them. Well, and we see, you know, he says in uh, verse 2, plead with your mother, because it begins by say to your brothers and your sisters, plead with your mother, for she is not my wife, and I am not her husband. Yeah. Uh, there seems to be a hint of of threatening divorce there, right? That's what that's the idea we got. Their estrangement, what she has done, is uh, is giving him grounds for divorce, so to speak. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But but you know Yahweh doesn't plan on divorcing; he plans on calling her back. That's his desire, absolutely. Right. That should be the desire of any couple that is in distress. 
and uh, and and of course the adultery that Hosea that God through Hosea is describing is grounds for divorce, and we can always justify ourselves, but uh, God's desire is always for unity. And I love, the, said, I love the imagery that, that Hosea gives us, that she shall pursue her lovers but not overtake them. She shall seek them but not find them. Then she shall say, I will go and return to my first husband, for it's better for me then than now. It's like there's, it's only in desperation do we turn to God. And don't we find that true? So often... There, we will go through life and we'll be perfectly content, so to speak, without God. And then when a terrible tragedy happens upon us, suddenly we're, and for obvious reasons, open and receptive to God's help. And, and mm-hmm. you, you bring that up, but what I also think is fascinating is in the next section where, verse 8, in fact, and she did not know, right? He credited, she had credited the Baals and all her lovers, et cetera, et cetera, all the, all the things that she had abandoned, she being Israel, of course, had abandoned God for and gave credit to them for, like the grain, the wine, the oil, silver, and gold. Well, that was from God the whole time, right? Because there, there is only one God. And we do yeah. that too, don't we? We, we? we take for granted the things that we've been given, and we might even attribute them to our own efforts, to other people, to the world, to the universe. But the reality is that all that we have is from God, and and that alone should cause us to be, or at least desire to be faithful. Yeah, amen. But it's, it, it is, it is. I mean, the the book of Hosea is such a portrait. I think that's why it's so interesting that God made it such. I mean, he, he took this intimate relationship that He gave to Adam and Eve, and He gave to us in marriage. And he took, and it's something that we all can relate to. And he took that to describe his relationship with, with Israel, and uh, and yet we see such tragedy in the world that goes on, especially in the divorce rates and all the sexual dysfunction and everything else that's going on in the world around us, where we're chasing after other gods. And I keep praying, you know, that that we will go back to our first husband who gave us all these things. Because we've right, we've that, squandered God's gifts of sexuality. There's just no question. Right, just one of the many things that we attribute or take upon ourselves as saying, you know, this this I have control of. This belongs to me. I, I can do right. with this what I wish. And, and when the re- and people, false teachers, false prophets out there are happy to take credit. You know, just as just as she's going after her lovers who give her the bread and water and wool and flax and oil. You know, and we know that that's only from God. We too, we chase after all these things in this life, and we think, okay, you know, the point of life is so that we can eat, drink, and be merry. And and you know, God just wants to wants me to follow all these rules and be and be miserable and not enjoy my own passions. But the reality is that all that's good for us is a gift of God. Yeah, I think we delude ourselves into believing that, well, God wants me to be happy, so I'm only going to be happy if I can do this. And God does not want us to be happy. I mean, that certainly happiness follows, but God wants us to be faithful. And when faithfulness occurs, then happiness follows. But, you know, we, we tend to elevate our own happiness above even our, uh, anything else. Right, and then he says, verse 11, I will put an end to all her mirth, her feasts, her new moons, her Sabbaths. So speaking more specifically, you know, we're talking about all of these different uh, pagan, for lack of a better word, feasts to Baal and other things where they um, basically are engaging in just the indulgence of their senses and their puerile interests. And, and God says, I'm going to put an end to that. And there is a time in a lot of people's life when the – when the end to the good times, so for whatever reason, comes, maybe it's terrible disease or illness. Maybe it's an accident. Maybe it's a, a, a mental struggle. Maybe it's financial. Maybe it's your own marriage. But everything seems to be going great without God, and then suddenly you need help. And if you've not called upon God, then you, you have 
basically divorced yourself from him. And this, and this is what God wants to, well, wants his people Israel to avoid. He doesn't want them just calling on him as a, as a supernatural vending machine to withdraw whatever they need when they're ready to, when they're ready to get it. And that's how they treat the Baals. And he certainly doesn't want them to treat him that way. And I, you know, I always try to impress it into my confirmants that God did not give us the Ten Commandments to wait to ruin all of our fun, right? He, these are limits placed upon us so that we can live the most fulfilled life. Uh, and yet we, we tend, I think, in times when we want to pursue our own, our own desires, we tend to feel like God is putting these restrictions on us to ruin our fun. And uh, and that's not the point at all. And so when you know, I find it interesting too in the section you just read that they have taken all the commands of God, feasts, new moons, Sabbaths, and appointed feasts, and they perverted those to give them to Baal. You know, in, in and of themselves, that's what he has commanded his people to observe. Uh, for the sake of a lot of things, rest and and recognizing the times and all of the other the things that God has given us these things for, and they've taken what God has given them and then perverted them and given them to the ball. Right. They they had you know accepted this Canaanite understanding that. There, there are lots of Baals, I think it should be noted for those out in the audience. And so, you know, there was a Baal that was responsible for the agricultural fertility. There's a Baal, different local ones for, you know, good crops, for rain, for everything else. So um, when we think of the different feasts like uh, Passover and Pentecost and and all that sort of thing, the Feast of Booths, all these things that God had given them to, as you said, for various reasons— they reattribute them to their own interests uh, as, as if God's there to serve them. And then because the true God isn't there to serve them, they find gods that do. And we see that yep. so much in our society today because God gives us these good gifts, but the good gifts are such that we can use them to serve our neighbor and so that we can be blessed. Uh, but then in turn that we can then praise God for what we have. And yet I, I, there are many ways I think in which we, we take the good gifts of God, even things like festivals and Christmases and Easter's and and all these sorts of things, and we reshape them in our own image after our own gods. Um, and I think actually Christmas and Easter are probably a, a pretty one to one scenario where we have this great feast of the church for a particular reason, and then it gets abused in ways that no longer point to the one true God. Yeah, I mean you you love all these. Uh you know, the Christmas movies that come out and, you know, Oh, I love Christmas because of the lights and the presents. And there's no mention of the birth of the Lord, you know, and there's just no conception. We have taken what God has given us and perverted it to our own use. Uh, And the same with Easter. If all we think about Easter is Easter bunny and, and Easter eggs, we've never, we've, we've perverted the, the whole, joy of the festival of Easter that God has given us. Precisely. And that's what they, I think is a good allusion to what they've been doing. But then we have, and just two more verses are left in this, this sort of declaration here, verses 14 and 15, which we haven't read yet, but there's a, there's a shift here. There's a turn Um, because it's just starting with 13 again. And I will punish her for the feast days of the Baals when she burned offerings to them and adorned herself with her ring and jewelry and went after her lovers and forgot me, declares Yahweh. Therefore, with 14, behold, I will allure her and bring her into the wilderness and speak tenderly to her. And there I will give her her vineyards and make the valley of Accor a door of hope. And there she shall answer as in the days of her youth, as at the time when she came out of the land of Egypt. The thought keeps going, of course, but just stopping with those two verses, adding it to our conversation, um, the Lord, Yahweh, wants to have mercy on Israel, and I think it's fascinating how he, what's, what's recalled here is the way she was when she came out of the land of Egypt. At a time when they had gone through hundreds of years of slavery and then were redeemed, 
They were overjoyed, like the moments after being rescued from drowning. You'll do anything for the person who saved you. But then in time, that desire to, I guess, um, you know, to be faithful wanes. And I can't help but think in our own country, in my lifetime, it might be closer to something like 9-11. But there are other instances throughout our country where some national tragedy or, or shared event has happened and suddenly people are flocking to the churches and then, of course, that doesn't last long. And, and it seems like God's saying, you know, I want you to have the zeal you had when you first were really, really connected with how I have rescued you. It's, it's been so long. You've, you've, you've put your attention toward, toward other false gods and given them credit for what I have done um, that you don't even remember what it's like. And so that's one of the reasons why this calamity is coming upon them, for him to draw them back. But we shouldn't wait for that calamity in our own lives. I mean, how do you see this? And I, uh, you know, it, it is so hard. I, I understand that, especially in, in our listeners' lives, you know, if they're taking the time to come and listen to this and study the scriptures with us, that's a true blessing. But how many are not because their lives are so busy? You know, th this time of Lent when we, put a big focus on daily devotionals for Lent, and you can get those just about anywhere. Um, and, and we start out so well with our Lenten disciplines and, and our Lenten desires to, to come back to the Lord and to, to inspect ourselves and whatever it is that we do during our Lenten devotionals. And then, you know, the devotionals start to wane over time, and life gets in the way, and things happen, and and it's 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 this recurring cycle of how we are are so unable to be steadfast. You know, when I when I read this this text, I think about Miriam singing and the people dancing on the shores of the of, of the Red Sea uh, after the after the redemption and the salvation from Pharaoh's armies. But then you know they go into the land and they don't have onions and they start to complain and they don't. You know, and you see this this inability in the part of humans to just be steadfast, and that's what the Holy Spirit. If we just listen, uh, if we would simply feel the promptings that the Spirit has given us, we might have a better job of being steadfast. But steadfastness is hard to do, and that's you know, it's hard to be steadfast for forty days during Lent, much less our lives. <laughs> Well, and that's why we rely upon, of course, the steadfastness of God, right? His steadfast love and kindness, which Amen. is which is why it says in verse 14, I will allure her and bring her into the wilderness and speak tenderly to her. And there I will, I will, I will, it says. So the Lord, I guess, you know, because he's almighty, he recognizes that he is the one who does the calling back. You know, very rare is it that we just sort of get within our desire, oh, you know, okay, I got to return to the Lord, but he brings us back either through the remembrance of the faith he gives us at baptism or through some event. Go ahead. And, and I love the word allure there because it is, uh, he, he calls to her with desire, sort of, you know, that's the, the nature of being allured. Uh, he, he, stimulates that desire within her to come back to him. And, uh, and that's, that's, I think what God is always doing with us as well. And we just need to, I, I don't, you know, I keep talking in law language and I don't really know. I mean, I'm a, I'm a finite human being who doesn't know anything, but um, I don't know. I wish I knew, you know, God, I think God is always calling us. But why don't we respond? I don't know the answer to that. <laughs> you know, interestingly enough, you know, the allure part, we can think of it in the context of Hosea and the immediate history. Um, Luther takes it as the time of alluring is going to be the time of the apostles, right? So Christ comes, and now right. the alluring happens because, you know, now it's calling uh, not only, of course, the people of Israel back, but but all people, you know, are are now properly being evangelized, um, and so you know, that's what is the, the the door of hope that's on the horizon. Um, we think of uh, we think of you know Joshua seven twenty six. 
Um, and they raised over him a great heap of stones that remains to this day. Then Yahweh turned from his burning anger. Therefore, to this day, the name of that place is called the Valley of Achor. And so there he says, um, and make the Valley of Achor a door of hope, nope. connecting it to when Christ comes and, and redeems the people from the anger of the Lord. What, what do you think about that interpretation? Yeah, in many ways, I, uh, I do think the season of Advent is too short. You know, in Advent, we give, I, I, yeah, I just, I don't, maybe I'm in a, it's, it's allergy season, so I'm probably in a bad mood. But I, it seems like in Advent, <laughs> we give lip service to the second coming. But do we truly anticipate it and listen for it and, and are excited about its return? Because that's when all things will come into balance. And, uh, you know, every day, the the end of, of revelation maranatha come lord jesus that's that's our that should be our daily sort of mantra again i'm speaking law language so pardon me for that but it is it is god is constantly calling us and he's given us his word you know he's given us the the holy spirit to go out and be hosea's among the people to be Isaiah, to be to be in a sense to occupy the office of prophet by proclaiming the word to others that they too might be a lord, and uh, that's that's the that's the season that we're in. While at the same time, hungrily awaiting that redemption. Well, I think there's a lot of truth to what you said. Not only I would say is the season of Advent a little short. But it's also one of those seasons that's kind of been usurped. It's always had this dual purpose of both pointing forward to the first advent when Christ came as a child, but also, and I think this is the part, as you mentioned, gets left out, pointing to the second advent. And and it's been really just reformed into this pre-Christmas season. And I think that definitely does a disservice to the people who are observing it. Yeah, and I think we get, you know, unfortunately, we get inundated by media and by sales, and, you know, life gets in the way. That's the answer, to, you know, to, to this, to the people of Israel and, and to us today is that we, we just have, to, I keep saying have, and I, I don't really want to, because, but I don't know how else to express it, but I don't want life to get in the way. Um, you know, it's going to be there. It's going to be overwhelming, the news and, and, you know, bills and everything else that comes along. But amen, come Lord Jesus, that Advent refrain. Well, I think that's a good place for us to just pause for a few moments as we ponder on Christ's return. But we're also going to take a break. When we come back, Pastor Parviz and I will keep on going with the rest of two into three. See you on the other side. These are the voices of young Lutherans in Mexico City, children who are excited to learn more about their Savior, Jesus. But they need our help, because good Lutheran books for kids in the Spanish language are in short supply in Mexico. To learn how you can help tell Spanish-speaking kids everywhere about Jesus in a language they can understand, go to the Lutheran Heritage Foundation website at lhfmissions.org forward slash Juan316. Welcome back to Thy Strong Word. I'm your host, Pastor Phil Boo. With me today is the Reverend Kevin Parviz, pastor of Congregation Kaiva Shalom in St. Louis, Missouri. Before we get back into the text, I just want to let you know that I hope you're finding our program both enriching and enlightening. If you have any feedback, questions, or thoughts, just reach out to me via email at pastorboo at gmail.com or by connecting with me on Facebook. As always, you can catch Thy Strong Word by tuning into the radio if you're in the St. Louis area or by visiting kfuo.org to listen online. 
And if you're like me and you're always on the move, you can stay up to date by downloading the KFUO app, which I highly recommend, or by subscribing to Thy Strong Word on your favorite podcasting platform. Either way, I'm so grateful and honored to have you with us for our study this morning. And if you're so led, be sure to share the program and the many ways to listen with your friends and family. Well, now, Pastor, before the break, you know, we were just getting into the idea that there is mercy on the horizon. God will call his people back. And I read verses 14 and 15. I'm going to go ahead and read the rest of the chapter, which is going to be verses 16 through 23 as Hosea finishes this thought, or maybe I should say as God finishes this thought through Hosea. Here we go. And in that day, declares Yahweh, you will call me my husband, and no longer will you call me my Baal. For I will remove the names of the Baals from her mouth, and they shall be remembered by name no more. And I will make for them a covenant on that day with the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens, and the creeping things of the ground. And I will abolish the bow, the sword, and war from the land. And I will make you lie down in safety, and I will betroth you to me forever. I will betroth you to me in righteousness and in justice, in steadfast love and in mercy. I will betroth you to me in faithfulness, and you shall know Yahweh. And in that day I will answer, declares Yahweh, I will answer the heavens, and they shall answer the earth, and the earth shall answer the grain, the wine, and the oil, and they shall answer Jezreel. And I will sow her for myself in the land, and I will have mercy on no mercy. And I will say to not my people, you are my people. And he shall say, you are my God. So that kind of finishes that thought that the Lord is going to have mercy on Israel. And I hear, brother, a lot of creation language and a lot of new creation language, right? New heavens and new earth language. What do you see? Yeah, I love the way, and I love, I always love the way God calls on nature to testify. Uh, it, it is in his, I mean, we, and, and I, I'm convinced that, if people were just to look around nature, they would see God's hand, and, and nature would testify to them about God's faithfulness. Um, and I, I love that language in this part of Hosea as well. Also, he, he brings in Hosea's three children at the end. Again, these these uh, object lessons, if you will, of these children who he's going to have mercy on no mercy. And uh, and it's, it's just wonderful language. And this is a picture— you know, I think is it a picture of Israel, the northern kingdom, that if they had bowed the knee to Yahweh and not to the Baals, um, would he have would he have preserved that nation? I have to say yes, but it's also a picture of the whole world and the time the time to come. Especially the, I will abolish the bow, the sword, and the war from the land, and I will make you lay down in safety. I mean, that is Isaiah language, right? It's second, it's, that's, that's second coming language, Messiah coming language. Absolutely. I mean, this is second coming. Um, you know, we think of, uh, we think of that, well, in the, you know, the, you quoted Isaiah. I think of that, that famous where the, you know the uh, the swords will be beaten into plowshares and that sort of stuff, and so we're we're talking well, I, about the yeah the ideal yeah. the ideal of what life will be like in the new heavens and the new earth, and this is for those who are faithful to God. But again, we also get that language that sort of I will allure her language. We see that too, right? I will betroth you to me. I will betroth you to me. Uh, in righteousness and faithfulness. Language again. Mm -hmm. But I, I also have to reiterate, I don't think, I don't think we have to wait for the second coming while I eagerly await it. Don't get me wrong, but we don't have to wait for the second coming to partake of the Lord's steadfast faithfulness to us. You know, we, we can, we can, even in this broken world, we can see his faithfulness and, and partake in the joys of being his faithful betrothed. 
Oh, absolutely. I mean, this restoration for Israel is seen first uh, in terms of chronologically. It's seen because it never becomes a nation again. So it really is seen after it's destroyed by Assyria, I should say. Um, it, right. it really be, it really becomes uh, uh, the, to, to its first fulfillment when the new nation of the Christian church is created from Jews and Gentiles and all people. That, that's when yep. we see this first. So we, we belong to that kingdom now in the same way that our eternal lives have already begun in our baptisms. We don't have to wait until we die to start living our eternal life. It's already begun in the same way that we already live in God's kingdom. Yeah, I'm always fascinated by the, the reality today. So, so Israel, in my mind, is synonymous with the adulterous northern kingdom that went into just into you know the ten tribes that disappeared right and yet paul talks about israel he doesn't use the word judah judah the, the southern kingdom and when israel became a nation they didn't take the name judah they took the name israel we take the name of this adulterous kingdom that God brings back. And so we are, in a, in a sense, by, by calling, you know, often we, we talk about the church as Israel, as Paul does rightly so. And, and so Israel is redeemed by Christ as we come into his faithfulness and call ourselves Israel. Uh, you know, that's not the first name I would call myself, even though that's what God called Jacob when, when they were wrestling. But uh, um, that's you know when you think about Israel the name it's synonymous with an adulterous northern kingdom that went into destruction, and yet we right. become Israel. We take that label, that name, wrestles with God up- upon ourselves uh, because God redeemed Israel through through Messiah. Way back, well, I guess it's not that far back, in the last chapter, um, it says that the Yahweh said to him, call his wife, or call his name, pardon me, his name, Jezreel, for in a little while I'll punish the house of Yehu for the blood of Jezreel, and I'll put an end, etc. And 11, he says the same thing, that uh, they shall go up from the land, for great shall be the day of Jezreel. And we see Jezreel pick up here again, um, and they shall answer Jezreel. Um, what is Jezreel? It's a city name, but it's sort of a very obscure prophecy. Do you know much about it, or what do we know about it? Um, you know, I, I, I can't, other than the fact that I know that it is of God, uh, that's the L part at the end, of course. Um, what we know about Jezreel is that it is uh, simply a, a, a valley of place, and that's a place, a name. Right, right. So it's a place the, where I guess they, you know, it, it's an obscure. L- Luther talks about it in the sense of, you know, the reason why this obscure, um, basically there was a battle that happened in the Valley of Jezreel. It's right between Galilee and Samaria. And so it's right at the beginning of their conquest in Judges. And um, so they, they're they basically starting to get a foothold. Luther seems to think that the reason why this obscure, uh, I guess, place was was mentioned is to kind of, hide the fulfillment from those who aren't in the know, sort of like Jesus does all the time. I don't know that I agree with them 100%. I think it probably is just something that the people themselves were quite familiar with that we're a little less familiar with now. But I just didn't know if you had any more insight in that. Well, I mean, in the ESV study notes, of course, it calls Jezreel the the name God will sow. And so... Even though the city, the the valley of Jezreel is a place where there have been battles and all manner of other things, the reality is that the name itself is a promise that sure. God will bring forth life even in this place. Exactly, and that's and that that's much much likely the the point that we're trying to look at here. Um, anything else before we read the, our last section, which is all of chapter three, but of course, chapter three only has five verses in it. But before we dig yeah. into that, anything else you want to bring out in the text that we've covered so far? Well, I uh, I just think 
you know, again, maybe it's because of Lent and it's on me for, for this right now. I will betroth you to me in righteousness and in justice and in steadfast love and in mercy. And those are the four things that we long for and will receive. I, you know, when, and I'm also getting older, so I'm thinking about these things as well. That's what I, you know, I, I, I can't wait to hear Jesus look at me and say, well done, good and faithful servant. And I can only persevere in that role without, with, with, only, with the power of the Holy Spirit. And so as we look at our Lenten, you know, we're going we're gonna to finish our Lenten season with this wonderful celebration of the resurrection, followed, of course, preceded by all the drama of Holy Week. Uh, I don't. I, I think that's that's something that we need to keep in mind as we go through whatever our Lenten discipline is. Is the reality that it is that steadfast love, that faithfulness, that righteousness, that justice that that God is pouring out on us, and and we see that in the person of Jesus who is risen. Uh, he is risen indeed. I love that refrain. Uh, and that's that's the focus of, of Hosea here in this chapter, and it's the focus of us during our Lenten journeys as well. Well, amen to that. Uh, in the next chapter— too, Go ahead. Yeah, it would be too, just to flagellate ourselves all Lent uh, right. and, you know, and say, I am, what a, what a worm am I, without keeping our eye on the end, which is the resurrection. Yeah, I've never seen Lent as a time when we're just supposed to be miserable the whole time. Lent is a, yeah. a restrained joy, right? It's a, a penitential joy where we, we because we already know the end, we know the end of the story. But it, it's healthy yeah. for us to take time, um, especially when our whole lives are kind of designed to ignore the pain and consequences of our sin. So while we certainly meet on Sundays and say we're poor, miserable sinners, which I think is kind of funny because we're actually fabulous sinners. We're very good at it. We're not miserable at it at all. But but during Lent, we it's just kind of like it's a little bit like uh, Valentine's Day. You know, you love your wife or your spouse or even your mom. You love or love them every day of the year. But that's a time to just sort of remember that. Yeah, this is this is a special relationship I have. And so Lent is that that time of year for us to say, while we know we're saved, we don't want to take that for granted. So, yeah, I really yeah. appreciate what you're saying. Amen. So in the next section, Yahweh is commanding Hosea to now, I guess, act out this object lesson a little more. And it, um, I think it'll be interesting for us to talk about how this affected Hosea as a person, uh, not just as a prophet. But this will be chapter 3, uh, verses 1 through 5, which are all of them. And Yahweh said to me, Go again, love a woman who is loved by another man and is an adulteress even as Yahweh loves the children of Israel, though they turn to other gods and love cakes of raisins. So I bought her for 15 shekels of silver and a homer and a leketh of barley. And I said to her, you must dwell as mine for many days. You shall not play the whore or belong to another man. So will I also be to you. For the children of Israel shall dwell many days without a king or prince, without sacrifice or pillar, without ephod or household gods. Afterward, the children of Israel shall return and seek Yahweh their God and David their king, and they shall come in fear to Yahweh and to his goodness in the latter days. So Yahweh says, Go, love a woman who is loved by another man and is an adulteress. Of course, that's him going back to claim, reclaim, redeem Gomer, his unfaithful wife. Um, maybe flesh that out for us. What's that looking like on the ground? I mean, I think this is, you know, I, I, uh, I have granted, you know, you go, go back to our catechism instruction. We are all adulterous. Uh, and so how do we reclaim those relationships by only by simply repenting and giving? I, I think so many people, uh, you know, the, the, what is that? Oh, goodness. Sorry about that. 
Why is that doing that? Anyway, the, I got distracted by a stupid thing on my phone. Um, when we go back to redeem our wives or the adulterous relationships that have harmed us, uh, as as Hosea did with Gomer, and I, I think Michael Card has a wonderful uh, piece of music that he wrote with regard to this uh, as well. Um, when it, it, this kind of sin can 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 destroy relationships, and yet by cherishing and honoring and desiring relationship. They can, it can be redeemed. And that's what God is doing with us, the adulterous generation that he comes to and, and woos and allures in this language. Uh, and we, we, he, we hunger for that relationship that God wants to have with us when, when we see the ability to be redeemed. You know, I would think that Gomer... Um, because we have this this object lesson through Hosea, uh, through chapter two of this woman who is chasing after the adulterous relationships that she's had, but can't catch up to them, and eventually comes back to the husband who then provides for those things, not the husband who rejects her. God is not the husband who will reject us. Jose is not the husband who will reject Gomer, but he will go to her and call her back. You have a picture here of the father of the son who, you know, runs away and, and, and spends his inheritance and ends up feeding pigs. Uh, the father is always looking for the son. The husband is always looking for the wife. It's that that clinging a relationship that God is desiring with us that that goes Jose and Gomer are epitomizing here right and we and we see that God just as just as you know he's going back to reclaim Gomer God continuously calls us back to uh I you know as I look at this text though you know there's some things that stand out kind of physically on the ground as it's happening that make give me some questions. So on the one hand, he says, go and love a woman. Now we assume, and obviously it is true that this is not just any woman, but rather it's specifically Gomer. And then oh, yeah. it says, though they turn to gods and love cakes of raisins from my reading, these raisin cakes were, um, basically sometimes uh, offered to idols, but also sometimes shaped like idols, but evidently that's part of idol worship. But getting right to the point, well, what is what does he mean in verse 2 when he says, I bought her for 15 shekels of silver? I mean, is, I, I guess I know this is a literal redeeming, but what is what is actually going on? Well, first of all, the cakes of raisins also uh, reminds me of Song of Solomon. And uh, that's the that's they they ate cakes of raisins. And there's a very there's a a sexual um, motif there as well going on. Um, so it's mm -hmm. not just about relationship, but it's also about uh, sexuality. And then you, you, you so essentially she's a slave to her desires. And so he redeems her back with 15 shekels of silver and a homer and lethek of barley. Uh, these things that she was chasing after her, form, her former husbands or her former lovers to give, give her, he pays that for her. There's that imagery of God again uh, redeeming us and purchasing us. And there's a reason why he has to purchase us. Uh, because we are bond slaves of the devil, and God God purchases us with the blood of of Jesus, and uh, in the same sense, that's what Homer or Gomer and Jose are doing. And then there's this expectation, though, that once they're back, you're going to have to you remain faithful. Follow. Yeah, you are to remain faithful. You so shall when not play as right. Yep. So when it says in verse four, the children of Israel shall dwell many days without a king or prince, what is that alluding to? 
I think that's the foreshadowing of what's going to happen. But um, in a sense, also, they're not, they're going to be taken. I mean, so without sacrifice or pillar, they're going to be taken out of their land. I think that this is a foreshadowing of what will happen. Even, even though God is wooing them back. And we, and we know the rest of that story. We know that Assyria comes in and, and destroys their, their worship places, their high mountains, and takes them into captive. And then afterward, the children of Israel shall return and shall seek Yahweh their God and David their king, and they shall come in fear to Yahweh and his goodness in the latter in the days. days. And that's yeah, the and those... time uh, that's happening now, but it's also right. happening not yet. Right, so that's the in the last days and the following days, right? So, so right. you know, um, this is figurative language. These are the these are the end. This is the end of the world stuff. So, but we also have all the nations streaming to the holy mountain by by evangelism and by all nations coming to faith in Christ, and and so these latter days are happening now. Yes, in shadow. Uh, they will be fulfilled in the time to come, but we we participate in these times by sharing our faith and by reaching others for, with the gospel. Well, that's certainly something for us to remember here this this time of Lent. So we're at the the end of the show, but I definitely want to give you the last few minutes here to just whatever message you want the people to have here as we finish up chapters two and three. I mean, I think that the message of these two chapters is simply to uh, listen. God is calling you. He is wooing you. He is redeeming you. He has done so, and he continues to do so. Um, Let this Lenten season be a time of, of, yes, I think, uh, penitent joy. I think that's what this is about. And, uh, and let that just rest in you uh, as we look forward to the time to come. Well, amen to that. Folks, I'd like to thank my guest this morning, the Reverend Kevin Parviz, pastor of Congregation Kaiva Shalom, that's fun to say, in St. Louis, Missouri. Thank you, Pastor, for being on the show. I hope your allergies don't get the best of you, brother. Man, I do too. Thank you so much. <laughs> Have a blessed Talk to you later. You too, brother. Tomorrow, folks, the program will be preempted by some Lenten worship, so be sure to check into that. Some great organ music there, too. But then come back on Thursday as we move right in to chapter 4. Now, there are hints in the section that we just read of the coming redemption for Israel and indeed our redemption. But in the next chapter, the prophet Hosea, who's now more empathetic to Yahweh's concern about the infidelity of the people, he begins to deliver a lengthy indictment against Israel and their wickedness against God. The people openly sin. The priests are leading the way. And God laments that lack of love for him and his statutes among them. And he, of course, forewarns of that coming judgment so that they could take seriously his desire for them to be faithful. But still, right, just like at Lent, we have right on the edge um, that the, the view of that what's coming is wonderful, that there is a there is a return of the people to God because God is going to allure them back. So folks, be sure to tune in for uh, to us for that. And I pray that your Lenten tide is going well so far. I look forward to being with you then. So until then, may God's peace and blessings be with you all as we pray, Father, keep us in thy strong word.